special here. Uh, Mr. Richard Strasinski and Ms. Gina Willis. We're really glad that you could be here and welcome to my faculty colleagues. This is the Fall 2018 Dean's Reception Series and we're very glad to have a guest speaker with us today. Let me tell you what the day is going to be like and the next uh, hour is going to go pretty quickly but we're really excited to, to be here with you today. First, for a few minutes, I'm going to brag a little bit, so bear with me on that, probably three or four minutes. Then Mr. Wiest, Mr. Chris Wiest, will speak to you, and then he's going to lead a question and answer period of time so that we can hear from all of you about what's on your mind and what you're curious about. And lastly, we're going to have a brief reception with cookies and whatever else you'd like to have over there. And it's really a delight to be able to have this experience with you. So I wanted to start this day by talking to you about what we're really good at in the School of Business and Management, because it makes me very proud, and I hope it does you too. So, a bunch of things, but first, we give you options. We're a school that has three different departments, Accounting, Economics, and Finance is one department, Business Administration is another, and lastly, we have Public Administration, which is a program that's graduate only, and that's at the REOC Center on the fifth floor, and we call that now affectionately Rockport Downtown. So we're a school that gives you options. We have five undergraduate majors, we have two different accounting, we have two different master's programs in business, and that is accounting and the brand new MBA that just launched this semester, and we have a variety of options in public administration. But there's a couple of really really cool, distinctive competencies that give us a great position in our competitive marketplace. And I think these bear mentioning again and again. First, we are an ACE ACSB accredited program. Only about somewhere between 0 and 10 percent of all schools have AACSB accreditation, and we're one of them. And we're talking worldwide. This is a great competitive advantage for the students and for our programs. Uh, what this means then is that you have that you have all been the, the uh, great benefactors of excellent faculty who do excellent research, and we have been vetted every five years or so since 2002. AACSP accreditation is very hard to get and it's very hard to keep. And we've done a really good job of that, so I'm quite proud of that. We also have eight Bloomberg terminals. These terminals are located in the same hallway as the Center for Student Success and the computer lab of the school in Harbor Hall. And these terminals are rich with financial markets information and also all kinds of additional management information on publicly traded companies. And it's a tremendous resource for students. You help pay for this through a fee that's attached to the finance class that you take in your course program of study. And we've had students tell us that because they are Bloomberg certified, and this is a self-tutorial that students take using the Bloomberg terminals, that they've received as much as $10,000 signing bonus when they get their first job. This is a big deal, and it's a tremendous distinctive confidence that we're really proud of. Let, not, not lastly, but importantly, we have a Center for Student Success, and this is attached solely to our business program, and it's solely for you. So all the way through your program, before your program, during your program, after your program, there's a staff of four people, and they're all sitting back there, wave your hands, guys, uh, who are there to help you with advising, with preparation for careers, and they work exhaustively to help prepare you for what's next in your career path. As Gina Willis is, of course, your instructor for the students in the room. Um, so we connect you with the external labor market and the Dean's lecture, lecture series is really, really important to that connection that we, we seek to make for you. The Dean's lecture series has been a part of what we do since about 2012 and in that span of time we've had some excellent speakers who have talked to students and to faculty alike about their worldview, about their expertise, about their journeys. And in fact, you can see many of these online on the web attached to the School of Business and Management. And today's lecture is also being recorded, so the students who can't be here with us right now are going to be able to review those at their leisure. <coughs> so make sure that you, you know, scratch your head carefully if you may be on camera. Bottom line, we've never been stronger than we are at this very moment, and I'm incredibly proud of the work that our faculty and staff do and that all of you are going to do to make us strong. 
So now let's get to the meat and potatoes. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Chris Wiest. I'm going to be reading from a bio, excuse me. Chris Wiest is Vice President of Public Policy and Membership for the Greater, Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce. In this role, Chris is responsible for developing public policy positions and managing Rochester Chamber's government relations function on behalf of nearly 1,300 member organizations. He is also responsible for overseeing Rochester Chamber's membership division. Prior to the Rochester Chamber, Chris worked in the Human Resources and Legal Departments at Harris Corporation, Schlegel Corporation, and Nixon Hargrave, Devins, and Doyle. He's actively involved in our community, having served on several boards, including Cure for, Roch for Childhood Cancer, Small Business Council of Rochester, Rock the Future, Monroe County Conservation Council, and City Rockford College Council. Chris holds a Master's of Science from Rochester Institute of Technology and a BA from the University of Rochester. He and his family reside right here in Rockport, and we're really proud to have him as a friend of the college. The title of Chris's talk today is How to Increase Your Chances for Success. Please join me, this is applause time, in welcoming Mr. Chris Wees. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And how about a round of applause for our dean? I'm a fan of Brockport. I'm a huge fan of Brockport. As Dean Stite Stowe said, um, I'm on college council, and I've had the opportunity to work with uh, a number of uh, folks here for for a wonderful period of time. Actually, I see Mike Andriach in the back there. He's uh, part of President McPherson's staff, and I, I'm sure you'll agree with me that President McPherson's doing some great things for this college and uh, uh, looking forward to its continued upward path. So I'm a Brockport area resident. I've lived here on the west side pretty much my whole life. Um, as I said, a uh, big fan of the school. My two boys, I'm proud to say they're both in college, and their first college experience was here at Brockport. They were seniors at uh, Brockport Central Schools, and they're all in spring semesters. They were able to take class over here at the college, had a great experience. It's helping them advance and move forward. As the dean said, the business school is doing some tremendous things. The new MBA program is fantastic, and the reputation of the business school itself is, is very good as well. So what are we gonna talk about today? That's probably an interesting title, how to increase your chances for success. I'm sure you're kind of wondering, what does this mean? It's a pretty, pretty large topic. Um, a month or so ago, when the Dean and I were sitting down for coffee, we were chatting about this series, and an opportunity maybe to come and speak with you today. And we were kicking around some ideas, and, and this, this title surfaced somehow, and I'm not quite sure who came up with it. It might have been the Dean, it, it, it might have been Mary, Mary Durleth, wherever Mary is, God bless her. She, she, uh, uh, it's fantastic in writing all this, but someone, uh, someone came up with this title and I said, yeah, I, I kind of like that, that kind of works. But we're not going to talk about just success in everything in life, that would be wonderful. If I could tell you how to be successful in winning the lottery, that would be great. How to win your fantasy football league, that would be great too. But I'm trying to think, what is an area that you might all have some interest in? So we're going to talk a little bit about, if I can get this to work. Well, we're going <laughs> to jump ahead two slides. We're gonna talk a little about success in your job search, right? How many in this room is, are either a junior or a senior? Show of hands, please. All right, so you're getting closer, right? You're starting to think a little bit about, about what's next. So we're gonna spend some time today talking a little bit about some keys that might be helpful as you think about your job search, as you think about your career, things that might help you advance through, through your career. So let me tell you a little bit more about my background, just to give you a little bit more uh, feel for where I came from. I knew just what I was going to do when I was a senior in high school. I knew exactly what I was going to do. I was going to be a teacher. I was going to be a teacher. I was going to teach social studies, and then I was going to um, coach football and track. I was an athlete. And then because I love the outdoors during the summer, I would, I would be a fishing guide on Lake Ontario. That was the plan. Went to the University of Rochester, studied history, 
got my teaching degree, and then I taught seventh and eighth graders. <laughs> seventh and eighth graders. Well, you know what? I figured if I can teach seventh and eighth graders, I can teach at any level. Good experience. I did it at Fairport. And then it came time to look for jobs, and there weren't any jobs around in this area at that time for, for social studies teachers. There were opportunities in New York City, Florida, you name it, but I wanted to stay in this region. So I had to think about my plan B, and that's tip number one. Have your plan A, but have plan B, and oh, by the way, C and D, okay? Think about different options, different things you may want to do. And one of the things that was appealing to me was law. I thought, okay. You know, I took a, a law class at, uh, at U of R, I liked it, did well. So I ended up taking a job at, at that time it was Nixon Hargrave, and I worked in the business litigation group. Great exposure to corporate law, got to know about companies, that sort of thing, and I was thinking law school. So I did my LSAT. Has anyone done an LSAT? Anyone thinking about it? All right, you're smart people. It's a nasty exam, right? But took my LSAT, I was thinking of, of law school, actually applied, I was gonna go to UB. Great SUNY legal program there. But I deferred, I worked at Nixon for a year, gained some great experience, and then ended up getting a job offer from one of Nixon's clients. That was Schlegel Corporation. They were a manufacturer, so it was the for-profit sector. They manufactured seals for windows and doors on, on uh, cars, uh, for the construction industry, those sorts of things. And I got a job in their corporate legal department. And I was doing legal work and human resource work. Again, this is far from what I thought I was gonna do, right? I was thinking I was gonna be a teacher right out of school. Well, now I'm doing legal work, I'm doing HR work. I liked it. We had 12 different U.S. divisions. We had seven different international operations. Got to know a lot of different folks. Got to work with them in uh, a lot of different things. But I was still thinking law school. I was literally two weeks from going to law school. And I'd been very open with my boss. I had told him, you know, all the way through. He knew what my plans were. And then he gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. He said, if we pay for your master's degree, will you, will you stay? That wasn't a hard decision. Right? I mean, that was not a hard decision at all. They ended up helping me with my master's degree at RIT, in human resource management, and I started doing more in the human resource area. And so he was my boss, he was general counsel slash director of HR, he started slotting more of that work my way. I been I began doing more and more of the HR work. I enjoyed it, it was, it was interesting, it was challenging, it was fun. I was working a lot in the regulatory compliance area, those sorts of things. I was managing the compensation structure for the company, its bonus programs, all that sort of stuff. Good experience. And then the owners of Schlegel, British Tire Rubber, decide they want to decentralize. They decide they were going to eliminate the legal department. That's what I worked in, the legal department, right? So, okay, now what? Well, that was an interesting summer. That was a summer that I was finishing up my master's degree, getting married, and building a house. So I was doing all those things at once. So, you know, it was, it was good experience, but a little, little stressful. And I'm thinking, okay, where to from here? And to this day, my wife won't let me live this town. I was networking at my wedding. Right? Yeah? Well, I'm hearing a few, few snickers, you're right. And she, to this day, she won't let me forget this. You know, at a wedding, you go around to the table, you thank everyone for coming to the wedding, you have this conversation, and I was talking to one person I know, and he, he said, uh, a relative of mine, he worked at Harris Corporation, he said, what are you up to? And I told him, I said, oh, I'm gonna be looking for a job soon. He says, oh, well, when you get back, give me your resume. Okay. So I got back from our honeymoon, and I gave him a resume, and you know, before you knew it, I had an opportunity to go in and talk to a few folks there, and then before you know it, I, I had a job at Harris Corporation, and I was working in the, the HR department. Any of you know what Harris Corporation is? Show of hands, a few hands, yep, yep, right? Manufacturer, they manufacture military radios, and the job I had was manage the college new hire program and the co-op program. So this was hiring new college grads, and every year Harris was dedicated, and to this day, they're still dedicated to bringing in new college grads. Great experience, and we're gonna get back to that in a little bit, because I'm gonna share with you a few things from, from that experience that might help you a little bit. But worked there for a while, um, again, enjoyed it. And one day I was calling a friend of mine at the Industrial Management Council. 
of Industrial Management Council's Employer Association, a nonprofit organization, and I was saying goodbye to her, wishing her farewell. She was leaving. And we were talking about what was going on, and she said, you know, this might be a job you might be interested in. I said, no, no, I'm, I'm enjoying where I'm at now, Terry. No, no, really. She goes, no, really, you, you might be interested in this job. Okay. Sent my resume in before you know it. I'm talking to some folks over there. So the Industrial Management Council, they were an employer's association that helped companies with their human resource needs. And I managed the HR services area. So anything that was an HR-related issue or question for an employer, I was trying to help them with. It was a helpline answering their questions on laws or regulations. It was surveys, giving them information on what are the going rates of pay for jobs in this area? What are companies paying for health insurance? It was the consulting practice, which was you know, doing ham HR handbooks, affirmative action plans, you name it, those sorts of things. Great broad experience, a lot of different areas, got to know HR managers. The IMC merged with the Chamber of Commerce, became Roster Business Alliance, and changed the same back to the Greater Roster Chamber of Commerce. And that led to kind of where I'm at today. About 12 years ago, 13 years ago, my boss said, I'd like you to think about taking on this role in government relations. I said, uh, no thank you. I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now. But she was very persuasive. And her argument was this. She said, okay, in the work you're doing right now, you're helping employers understand what they need to do to comply with laws and regs and those sorts of things. And that's great. That's very helpful to them. But what if you could help shape some of those laws and regulations, help employers' voice be heard on these, these matters? That could be very helpful. And it was a very persuasive argument. It was another challenge, something new and different. And I took that on. And so that's what I've been doing. I've been doing government relations. I am a registered lobbyist with New York State. I do public policy, government relations, community relations, uh, membership, a little bit of all that sort of stuff. Why did I share all that with you? Because no two people in this room are going to have the same roadmap in your jobs or in your career. And I'm willing to bet that you're going to be in very different places than what you're envisioning right now. And that's OK. In fact, that's a good thing. But it emphasizes the importance of keeping an open mind and thinking about where there may be opportunities that are going to fit with your interests and your skills, right? So that's a little bit of, of my background. Let's talk a little bit more about where things stand right now for the job market, give you a, a feel for, for what's going on there. And you know, um, newsflash, it's a strong job market, right? I mean, we go out, we meet with our member companies of the chamber. And the chamber, uh, just to give you a flavor for what, what we are, we're, we're an employer's association. We have about 1,300 members, as the dean said. They pay us dues, and we provide services in return. So our services are advocacy. We help represent them on issues at the local, state, federal level. We work on economic development, those sorts of things. We have networking events, so it's business owners can get together, kind of you know, share ideas, hopefully. Um, you know, sell some product to each other, those sorts of things. We do events, training, you name it, those sorts of things, and then HR services. So all that's bundled into what, what the chamber does. But one of the things that we do quite often is we go out and we visit with our members, and we try to find out, you know, what's on your mind? What's important to you? What are things we can do to be most helpful? I will tell you, without fail, the number one issue that we're hearing from employers right now, when we ask them, what are your needs? Where do you need help? Jobs, workforce development, talent. We're having a hard time finding the talent we need to get the work done. It's a strong job market. And again, that's borne out by what you're seeing here. If you take a look at, this is the most recently available data. It was from August um, of last year to this year. And you'll see that we went from 4.8% New York State outside of New York City. That's basically upstate. Okay, 4.8% to 4.3%. That's strong. If you take a look nationally, 4.4% to 3.9%. So anywhere you're going, you're seeing signs right now for you know, help wanted, those sorts of things. Does that, make it, does that mean that it's easy to get the job that you want? Nope. Maybe. Because there is demand, but employers are still gonna be selective. So let's talk a little bit about about where some of those opportunities might be and what they might be looking for. Ooh, well, that's interesting. 
our, for, our uh, version of PowerPoint doesn't like your, your version of PowerPoint, apparently. So where the jobs are. This is information, this data is from the Department of Labor. And I asked the labor analyst there, I said, okay, what, uh, I'm gonna do this, this talk in, in a few weeks. For college students with four-year degrees, where are the jobs? Where's the demand right now? And she ran this list for me. It's a huge spreadsheet. I think I almost went blind trying to pick out all the, all the information, but I, I picked out the top 10. And you know, SUNY Brockport is well positioned in this area, right? I mean, you look at this list and these are a lot of jobs that are represented by the programs here. Number one, registered nurses, a lot of RNs. But now take a look at all the business-related type positions here too. Operations managers, general managers, accountants and auditors. How many folks in here are finance majors, accountant? Okay, there you go. It's looking good, right? Teachers, a lot of teaching opportunities at all different <coughs> levels, elementary, secondary. Systems analysts, computer software developers, computer related jobs, managers, market research analysts, and then software developers. So that's, that's kind of where things stand right now. Probably not a huge surprise, right? I mean, you would expect to see a lot of those jobs there. So then my next question was, okay, that's great. Where are the jobs going to be looking out a ways, right? So it's, it's good to know where jobs are right now, but down the road, where are there going to be opportunities? Wow. All right, trust me, the formatting was good on the version that we <laughs> sent over. Where job growth will be. Top jobs by projected growth. All right, so for systems analysts, almost 24%. Security analysts, again, 24%. Software developers and applications, 23%. Market research, info system managers, 20-some percent. Personal finance managers, okay. So people are getting older, they need help in figuring out what to do with their money. Managers, people, can you assist in that? There you go, about 20%. Health educators, meeting convention and event planners, I don't know why there's such a demand for that. I can't understand that one, but you know, about 19%. Analysts. And then unfortunately, probably another sad reflection on the times in which we live, but substance abuse uh, and behavior disorder counselors is also going to be a growth area. So that shows you a shift in terms of where jobs are anticipated to be out in 2024, taking a little bit of a, a look out. So when you look at that, and, and you're probably hearing from a lot, of, a lot of folks, you're reading a lot of things today saying, geez, you know, Jobs are changing really quickly, really fast. Some of you may have heard there's this popular um, phrase out there that, that for students that are in grade school right now, that about 60, 65% of the jobs that they end up in haven't even been invented yet, right? Just because of the rate of change and society and technology, where things are headed. I would, I would submit to you that that's probably always been the case. It's just the rate of change is starting to accelerate more, right? Richard Riley, he was the former secretary, US, U.S. Department of Education under President Clinton. And this is from the 90s, by the way, but still applies today. We are currently preparing students for jobs that don't ex yet exist, using technologies that haven't been invented, in order to solve problems we don't even know are problems yet. Does that apply today? Yeah, absolutely does. And think about how jobs are changing. Think about how they're changing. Back in the early 1800s, the number one job in this country, where were most people working? Any guesses? Think about it, 1800s, yes sir. Factories. Factories, uh, good thought, Little might be a little early for the industrial age, but keep thinking, yep. Farms, Farms yes. Agriculture, about 90%, about 90% of the jobs at that time were, were agriculture. Now, what do you think the percentage is today? Shoot out some, some thoughts. 10%? 10? 10 a little high still, believe it or not. Eight, <laughs> I'm just gonna keep going. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir? Closer. 
Think about that. We went from 90% to 2%. You're not surprised by that, though, right? I mean, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, it's the way of the world, those sorts of things. But think about how jobs, jobs are, are shifting. Eastman Kodak Company. Anyone have anyone, a, a parent or a relative, a grandparent that had worked at Kodak? A few hands? Yeah, actually quite a few hands. I mean, this was known back, especially in the 70s and the 80s, as a Kodak town, right? Back in the 80s, Eastman Kodak had about 65,000 employees in Rochester, just in Rochester. And a lot of the work was in support of products that they are no longer making, right? They had disc cameras, they had Instamatic cameras, they had all these sorts of things. Today, Kodak has less than 3,000 people. Digital cameras came along, kind of shifted that whole dynamic in terms of you know, what consumers wanted. More competitors came into the, the market. It really changed their business. So things shift, things change. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the keys to success. And, this by no means is an exhaustive list. This is by no means gonna be just like, you know, some huge revelation that all of a sudden is gonna make everything work out for you. But these are just a few observations from working with companies over the years as to what they look for, what could be important uh, to you as you think about finding that first job, advancing your career, some things that might be be helpful along those lines. And then we'll finish things up and we'll, we'll open it up for, for any questions you might, you might have. First area is focus, right? Sounds simple, sounds easy, but boy, is it important. How do you focus on the type of job you want? And I would suggest to you, don't think of necessarily just the job. Think about the skills and the things you like to do. All right, going back to my situation as I opened up our conversation. Teaching, right? I thought I was going to do teaching. I didn't end up being a teacher per se at that point in time, although I might be coming back to that. But I did find ways through my various jobs to do teaching. Right? Every one of these roles that I've had, I was able to find a way to do some type of teaching to adult learners. Maybe it was training, maybe it was you know, writing newsletters, describing what they need to know about new laws and regulations, there was some element to that. But having focus and trying to identify specifically what it is that, that you're good at, that you have interest in, that you want to do, is going to serve you well. Danny Wegman. Wegmans, right? One of the, it's a wildly uh, successful company. We will agree on that, right? Done some fantastic things model employer for our community. One of the mantras, one of the quotes that is said repeatedly among CEO circles in Rochester comes from Danny Wegman. And it's on the area of focus. And it's focus and finish. Focus and finish. That's part of the Wegman's culture. Okay? Identify that goal. They have accountability and measurements in place and execute or be successful. And by the way, they add one more word to that at Wegmans. Focus, finish, and celebrate. Celebrate your success, right? Dependability. Okay, one of the things at the chamber that makes us a little unique from a lot of chambers is we have a, a full-fledged human resource staffing division. So it's, it's recruitment, it's placement. Companies will call us up, say, hey, you know, we have to hire XYZ jobs, can you find us some candidates, blah, 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 blah. And that's a big part of our business. We're actually, I think, the third largest placement firm in Rochester. Okay. I asked, uh, last week, I asked the director of the staffing division, I said, okay, you got 10 seconds, give me one word. One word, what is the one thing that employers are looking the most for? A new hire. What is it that they, what's that one characteristic, one trait that they want? You didn't even hesitate. Didn't even flinch. Dependability. That's it. So as we're talking to all these employers and they're saying, we need help, we need support, we need you know, assistance, what do you need most? We need dependable employees. There's a lot in that word. Think about it. 
That's not just attendance, which is actually one of their biggest things, people showing up on time, not just on time, but being ready to work at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, whenever the shift starts, right? Those sorts of things. But are they dependable? Is this worker dependable to get the work done? Not just to get the work done. Are they dependable to do a high-quality job? Can I rely upon them? If something you know, goes crazy and nuts in the work environment, I need someone to step in and to help out. Is this person going to be dependable? Can I look to them to provide that help and support? If you can be successful in this area and be effective in communicating how you've done this through your work experience to date, through your, your work here at school, that's going to be noticed. Employers are going to, they're going to take notice on that. So I'll throw in a few more abilities besides dependability, flexibility, adaptability, right? These are all traits that are going to help you. And think about that as you're going to be doing your, your interviews, right? Your interview, you're selling yourself. It's your brand. You want this to be recognized as part of your brand, right? Dependability, flexibility, adaptability, all these sorts of things. Think how you want to weave that into your, your story. Oh. We get two, we get a two for it. So, details. Details matter. I will tell you with certainty almost that the um, person that came up with the phrase, don't sweat the small stuff, was not a recruiter. Recruiters sweat the small stuff. They do. They look at, they're trying to differentiate. They're trying to find the best possible candidate. So they look at details. So let me take it back. I told you about when I was at Harris Corporation and I managed the, uh, the college new hire program. So I was filling a job one time. It was, um, it might have been actually in the business area. It might have been a, a marketing position. And I got a resume and a cover letter from a student from a SUNY. It was not Brockport. You're very clear on that. And I looked at uh, the cover letter and and you know, actually even the envelope that was addressed to, and the first thing I noticed was the company's name was misspelled. Harris was misspelled. Okay, not a good way to start out. And then I looked at the cover letter. Dear Mr. Weist, my name was misspelled. And then it started becoming almost, you know, almost a sport. I got out of the pen, I started circling. Doo -doo -doo. There were 10 different spelling errors throughout the document. Right. So actually, now it's coming back to me. This was an engineering position. This was not a marketing position. Engineers have to be precise, right? These, these folks were going to be designing these military radios that were going to be used in battlefield conditions. These things cannot fail. These have got to work. They've got to be precise. So what sort of message was this sending to me as a recruiter? This was the first contact, the first impression I had, looking at the cover letter, the resume, Probably the most important thing this person was doing into their, in their life up to this point, their first real job. And they didn't bother to spell check. They didn't bother even to have a friend review it just to check it over sort of thing, right? That didn't get too far in the process. Details matter. Even more recently, Canada, last week at, at my current place of employment, we had a, uh, someone apply for a job I'm looking at the resume, I'm like, okay, some good stuff here. Take a look at the competencies, great. Detail-oriented, yes, like to see that. Two spelling errors in their resume. Do not put detail-oriented in your resume and then have two spelling errors in your, in your resume, right? Sends the wrong, sends the wrong message. So that's, that's something to, to think about, because recruiters do. They look at those sorts of things when they're, when they're differentiating. Connectivity, it's your network. Right? It's kind of building out your, your network. You're doing it right now in college. You may not think about it, but you're doing it. You, know, you're, you have your, your groups of friends that you associate with. If you're an athlete, maybe you're in uh, some teammates there. Maybe you have some uh, clubs that you're part of too. That's a network. Think about expanding that into professional networks. 
word of mouth is still a huge way to get a job. It really is. And it's even more important for once you get that first couple jobs for advancing your careers, right? And there are all sorts of tools out there. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Yep, okay. LinkedIn's very helpful. How many of you have Facebook pages? Yeah, a few, yeah, quite a few too. <laughs> I was talking with one of our recruiters yesterday. She said, tell the students to be very careful on Facebook, right? And what she was saying is, you know, good rule of thumb is do not post or put any pictures or anything on Facebook that you would not want your mother or grandmother or anyone else to see. Because, and you know this, but just to repeat what you probably already know, one of the first things a recruiter will do when they see that you're a candidate, they're gonna go online. They're gonna look. LinkedIn, Facebook, they're gonna look and see what, what's out there. So be conscious of that. Think about those, those sorts of things. What do you want your brand to be? What do you want them to think of when they think of, of you? Connectivity is important. Finally, last item, and probably the most important, continuous learning, All right? Years, years ago, it might have been sufficient just to have functional knowledge in one area, you know, if you worked in manufacturing or whatnot, you could just know how to do this one, one job and you could actually have a very, very good, long career. Now, things are changing so quickly. We talked earlier about the rate of change, how things are moving, right? You have to be constantly updating your skills, constantly um, learning new ways of doing things, better ways of doing things, and employers are attracted to that. So if there's ways that you can emphasize what you've done in your work experience, and your school experience, to show that you have a, a real strong desire to be continuously learning, it's gonna serve you well. Okay. So if we're talking about some of the things that are gonna help you be successful, what's the opposite of success? If I was to ask you to think of a word or a couple words that would be the opposite of success, what comes to mind? Just shout out anything. Failure. Failure. Who else would agree with that? Failure. I've seen a bunch of hands. Yep. That's the sort of thing that comes, comes to mind. If you're my wife and you're asked this question, you'll say, not successful. Technically, she's correct, but that wasn't the answer that, that we were looking for. Failure comes to mind more often than not when you're asked this question, but it may not be the best answer. And what got me thinking about this is we did a, an event a few weeks ago. We had someone, it was a tech conference, we had a keynote speaker, and he was talking a little bit about this. And he was saying the opposite of success, it's not failure. It's not even trying. Not trying, right? So you look at the West Coast, Silicon Valley, you know, all the things that are happening out there, and now are happening in Rochester more and more too, by the way. It's a badge of honor for a lot of those companies, those tech companies for, um, failures and learning and moving on to something else. Maybe it's new technology, it's a new platform, it's a new device, whatever. They've learned from that and they moved on. Sometimes here in Rochester there's a, a reluctance to move, you know, put yourself out there. And that could be one of the biggest, biggest failures, just not trying at all. Thomas Edison, Enter the light bulb. He was asked once about, you know, how many times it took him to, to get it right. And, he's, and, you know, what the failures were. He said, well, it wasn't a failure. I just learned 10,000 ways how not to do it. 10,000 ways. He learned something each and every time, and he got better, right? So it's all about trying. All right, let me leave you with one, one final thought. Let me not leave you with one final thought. Let me read to you one final thought on the hard copy. See, it's always good to have backups. Any of you know Wayne Gretzky? Yeah? 
Okay, Wayne Gretzky. What is his name? For those of you who know Wayne Gretzky, what is he known as? Do you know someone? The Great One. All right? Isn't that, a great, isn't that a good brand to have, just to be recognized as the Great One? Why was he the Great One? Because he's such just about every NHL record known to man, right? He was phenomenal. And he's got some really good quotes. I'm not a, a, a big hockey fan, but boy, I love some of this guy's quotes. And here's one I think would be one of his keys to success. The day I stop giving is the day I stop receiving. The day I stop learning is the day I stop growing. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. All right? Don't be afraid to take that shot. Do that and you'll be successful. Thank you. You're so luckily, we have some time for questions and answers, and I'm going to walk around with this to the best of my ability. But before I do that, a reminder from your two professors that you have a sign-up sheet to sign before you leave. Okay? So who's got a question for Mr. Who's got a question? Excellent. Yes, ma'am. You can stand if you wouldn't mind. What are some of the responsibilities or projects that I'm currently working on? Oh, good question. Well, actually, I'm going to leave here today, and I'm going to go back to the office. I, I told you a little bit about the government relations work that I do. So tomorrow, we're bringing in 16 candidates for uh, Senate assembly and Senate races. And we have a PAC, Political Action Committee. Our board is going to interview the 16 candidates and decide whether or not we're going to be endorsing them or not. So it's a great opportunity to really share with these candidates issues that are important to the employer community. Um, employers are job creators, right? They're the folks that we're looking to to hire all you guys. What are some of the things that are going to be important to help them be strong and successful? We're going to spend a lot of time on that, uh, those conversations with them tomorrow. Yeah, so that's a very big near-term term project. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your question. My name is Trevor Sheldon, That's right. a finance major, and looking back on what you've done, what is your greatest achievement and what are you most proud of? Oh. Okay, I already told you about my family, so that's got to be number one, my two boys and my wife. Um, you know, we had a project that uh, we worked on, well, back in the early 2000s, in the mid-2000s, and it was an effort known as the Roster Community Coalition. And it was pulling together a lot of different entities throughout our region. It was colleges, it was employers, it was government, it was the county, it was the city, nonprofits, you name it. And we came up with um, a series of priorities for our region that we would take to Albany, and then we would talk to our legislators about to try to get them behind. And it was a very rewarding effort. I kind of played the role as project manager, trying to kind of herd all the cats, get everyone to try to agree on, so what are going to be these six or seven things we're going after? And um, you know, through the efforts of a lot of people, a lot of hard work from a lot of different groups, we, we saw some success over the years. And I think over the maybe six, seven, eight years that we did this, um, just to attach a number to it, over over $400 million um, in, in assistance came to this region on, on a variety of different projects. So I would say that's probably one of them. And I, I always kind of liked, uh, I, I got feedback once from someone who worked on an HR committee that I, I ran, a healthcare group. And she said, you know what? She goes, I don't even know what the priorities are for the community coalition, but I love every year just seeing that picture of everyone standing there linking arms and saying, this is what we support as a region. This is what we support as a community, showing that unity. Seems like we could use a little bit more of that these days, right? So, thank you. We've got time for a couple more, and I know some of you have a hit hard stop at 11.50, right? So next question. 
Faculty, any questions for me? Melissa, wait, wait. I don't know. We've got a professor. I got nice for you. <laughs> so, so, Chris, I'm Yeah. Really, your lobbying activity is designed to bring economic development and revitalization to Rochester. So can you talk a little bit about being a lobbyist, what you do, how you go about being a registered lobbyist in New York? Have you ever been in the presence of lobbyists before? Yeah. You know, it's one of those terms I use sparingly myself, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, you know, I, to be honest, I use the term more of advocate. It's an advocate. But... There are technical requirements. If you are an advocate on behalf of a certain group or constituency and you're talking with state representatives or leaders, you've got to register to be a lobbyist. And so there's reports you have to file. There's you know, all sorts of things like that to make sure that you're, um, you're complying with the, the regulations. Of course, we, we do all that. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting work. But I will say this. A lot of people lobby. They may not do all the paperwork or whatnot, but there's a lot of groups out there that are constantly talking to legislators that are uh, advocating on their behalf. You know, you're, you're Joe Q. Citizen. You're walking down uh, the Apple Festival this past weekend. I was walking out. Joe Morelli came walking in. I bet you Joe's ear was being bent from a number of different folks as to you know, what issues were, were important to them that they wanted him to think of if he becomes our next congressman, right? You all should think about that, too. Right? I mean, how do you want to engage? What do you want for our community? How do you think legislators should be responding? You should be advocates as well. You don't have to be a registered lobbyist to do that. You, know, you can communicate your, your uh, issues and your priorities uh, as well to their staff, to their offices. And I would encourage you to, to, to do that, to be in, involved, be engaged. It's your future. Thank you. Uh, my question is, what obstacles to success have you faced uh, either for yourself or with the Chamber of Commerce? Oh, wow. Well, that's a good question. Obstacles to success. So I think one of the obstacles that, even as a community, but as a chamber that we run into quite, quite often, it gets back to the one, that first key is success that we talked about, which is focus. Right? As a community, we have a lot of great ideas. A lot of great ideas. But many times, it's the execution side. Right? There's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of uh, well intentions and a variety of different things going on in the community. But sometimes people lose focus and they start straying into, into other areas. And so, one of our jobs at the Chamber of Quidancy is trying to keep people more focused, is trying to bring them back so we can show some accountability, so we can show some, some progress, those sorts of things. So I would say that, that particularly in the world of government relations, you run into that a lot. Anyone that's watching you know, the, the stuff out there right now, the political ads, you see a lot of this you know, misinformation, redirection, those sorts of things, and all sides do it. No one side has a monopoly on that. Everyone does it. But it's trying to sift through that and really get to a point of, uh, execution so we can do some positive things for for our community. Thank you. That's a good question. Students, thank you so much for your participation today. Chris, we'd like to give you a small token of our gratitude to remember us by. <laughs> and thank, thank you again you. so much for being here. He'll be here for a little bit longer. I know some of you have to leave, so let us thank him again.